Okay, uh, before we start the meeting, I'd like to go over some ground rules. Uh, this will be a completely virtual meeting using the Zoom webinar platform. The platform has a capacity of 100 attendees. Public participants will be muted except during the public po uh, comment portion of the meeting where individuals wishing to comment will be unmuted individually. Members of the public can indicate their desire to provide comment either by submitting a request in advance or by using the raise, raise hand feature of the Zoom, uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, members of the public are asked to state their full name and address at the start of their comments. As with our in-person meeting, this, board, this meeting is being recorded and will be made available on the district website uh, after the meeting. Um, note this is a special uh, meeting of the board specifically to distress, discuss and provide input on the budget and related matters. Um, after the Pledge of Allegiance, I ask that all participants remain standing for a moment of silence in memory of Dave Kopp, a member of our maintenance staff who passed away on May 11th, 2020. Uh, with that, I'll now ca uh, call the um, May 26th uh, special meeting of the East Penn uh, Board of School Directors to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Mrs. Campbell, I think you uh, wanted to make a comment. Yes, as a follow-up to the moment of silence that we all just observed, I wanted to share that it is with great sadness that we um, recognize Dave Cope, a valued member of our East Penn family, who passed away earlier this month. Dave joined our East Penn custodial staff in 1997 and he worked throughout his career in East Penn at Emmaus High School, Shoemaker Elementary, followed by Jefferson, and finally Lincoln Elementary. I had the pleasure of working with Dave when I first began in the district as a teacher at Shoemaker Elementary. And so our, our history and relationship together is over 20 years old. And Dave will certainly always be remembered and honored for his dedication and loyalty to the district his pride in the work that he did every single day, his positive relationships that he had with everyone, all of the professional support staff, and probably most importantly, his positive relationships with the students in the buildings where he served. And finally, Dave will also be remembered for his sense of humor. Our heartfelt condolences go out to Dave, family, and friends. Thank you. Hey, um, we'll move forward to a roll call. Um, Ms. Allen, will you call the roll, please, for attendance? Ms. Bowman? Present. Mr. Bird? Present. Mr. Champagne? Present. Mr. Jankowski? Present. Dr. Levinson? Present. Dr. Munson? Uh, were you on mute? Dr. Munson? Dr. Munson? He's present. <laughs> He's saying one moment. <laughs> Mr. Smith? Present. Ms. Winch? Present. Dr. Bacher? Present. All present. Okay, uh, move forward to request to address the board. Um, uh, we've had one advanced uh, notice. Uh, Mrs. Stephanie Offord, can you unmute her so she can? I tried before and now she's disappeared again. She's not on my list. Uh, I see talking permitted for Stephanie Offord in my list, but she's. Mm -hmm. I don't see her on mine. It could be that she's, by me doing that, allows her now to speak. But she might be muted uh, on her end. 
Mm -hmm. because I have a mute sign. I see talking permitted, but muted. Uh, well, we appear to be having uh, technical difficulties. If uh, Mrs. Offord is trying to speak, uh, we apologize. We can't hear you. Um, are there hold any on. other? Oh. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm clicking on, I just found her. I'm trying to click on mute. I believe she may there have. She, there, yeah, she, is she showing that she's there now? She's okay. able to speak now, yeah. Yes. Please continue, Ms. Alford. Oh, hello. Are you addressing me? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Hi. I'm sorry. I was, uh, I was indisposed for a moment. Um, yeah. Hi. I was just, my, my question was just regarding, uh, do you have a time? I know that you're trying to figure out what's going to be happening for the fall. And I was just curious if you had a timeline as to when you planned on kind of reaching a consensus on what, it was going to look like for the students this fall um, so that we can start planning. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you for your comments. Uh, this is usually not interactive. I don't know if the superintendent wants to say some uh, words. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for joining us this evening as well as, um, as your, your question, which I'm sure represents a question that's on the minds of many people in our community. I will share that our administrative team at our upcoming June 8th board meeting plans to bring forward a framework or a skeleton for um, multiple scenarios for which we plan to be prepared for the fall. As you can appreciate, um, the beginning of the fall, the beginning of the 2021 school year um, at this point in time can certainly take on um, any number of situations depending on how we progress throughout the summer. And so our plan would be that we share with the board and the community the different scenarios for which we will continue to plan over the summer. Um, I will also share that some of those preliminary plans, we have a component in which we will be asking for some community feedback as well on some of the scenarios that we'll be presenting. So we hope that you're able to continue to join us for our board meetings. Um, in particular, I think that June 8th one will help to give you um, some guidance in terms of planning for the future. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, so we'll continue with the rest of the meeting, which uh, next item is debt service restructuring presentation. Mrs. Campbell or Mr. Saul, do you have an introduction before we get into the presentation? We'd simply like to introduce, um, joining us this evening is Scott Shear from PFM. And I believe he, we may also hear from Ken Phillips from RBC Capital Markets, but I see Scott, and so I believe he will be kicking off the presentation. Yeah, I will be, and unfortunately, Ken is having some technical difficulties. I was just on the phone with him, and okay. for some reason, he wasn't able, he was having computer issues and Zoom issues and everything else, so he, he apologizes, but I will brief him after the call. Um, Bob, were you able to, are you able to pull up that presentation up online? Yes. Or would you like me just to kind of talk from it? E either one. I can share my screen. There we go. There. Can everyone see that? Perfect. Yes. Yes. Yep. Perfect. All right. Bob, if you don't mind going to the to the next page, please. So, so one of the things, you know, as as the district's financial advisor, you know, one of the things that we're always kind of in communication with the administration is any sort of refinancing opportunity. So we're always looking at the district's outstanding debt portfolio, and as you know from years past, when there's an opportunity um, to come back to to the administration and ultimately to the board to present a refinancing opportunity, we we surely do that, and that's the, the whole team's always looking at this and, and keeping in touch with each other and we've been watching uh two bond issues now for for quite some time one for for quite a bit longer for a couple years now and one more recently has become callable and those two different bond issues are illustrated up in the top of this page here where the series of 2012 there's about six and a half million outstanding right now um 
the average rate on those is just a little under 2.2%. The call day was actually a couple of years ago. So we, we've been keeping in touch. Uh, me and Ken have been chatting with, with Bob at the school district on the opportunity to refund those. And it really never produced a whole lot of savings. Um, and it, it, it is a, a relatively short transaction um, as well. And so that's one we've been we've been watching. And the Series B of 2015, you know, about 2.8 million outstanding on those, uh, average rate of around 2%. And uh, the call date we just actually passed it back in in April, which was kind of the first available time to to refinance it. So those were the two uh, different bond issues that we've been watching for um, a potential uh, refinancing opportunity. So I guess it was, you know, Bob now maybe a few weeks or so ago or a month that in, in discussions um, with the administration on, you know, kind of what those numbers look like, it, the, the conversation then changed a little bit to, um, to look at instead of doing what I'll call plain vanilla or more traditional refunding, uh, where we're just going from a higher rate to a lower rate to achieve savings, which is what we've done many times for the school district, we, we ran some options regarding restructuring those, you know, one or both or a portion of one or both of those bond issues. Uh, and when we say restructuring, I, I mean actually kind of changing the amortization a little bit, maybe extending it a, a year or two or three years um, to provide some cash flow relief. And for those that were on the board back about four years ago, we did a very similar transaction in 2016 for you know, kind of some, 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 some similar reasons as we're contemplating right now or experiencing right now. So that was sort of how the conversation have, has evolved here, you know, kind of over the past couple of years since we've been watching the, the 2012 bond issue. So we have two different scenarios that we have labeled scenario one and scenario two that we highlight on this page and then we have a summary page following. Um, but if we go to section three here, where it's scenario one, where we're just restructuring a portion of the 2012 bonds, um, since they're callable, it's, it's a little bit more efficient. So the third bullet point under the third section there, where it says refunding a portion of the series of 2012 will give the district relief in the 21 year, the 22 year, and the 23 years and extending the debt out to the 24 and 25 fiscal year. So again, basically you're carving a little bit of the principal that is due to be paid back in 21, 22, and 23, and kind of carving that out and, and putting that in uh, the out years in 24 and 25. So we're not really extending it too much, just a, a couple of years. Um, and we want to be kind of very clear, like we, had, we were back in 2016, again, when similar transaction was ultimately executed, was when you're restructuring debt, it does come at a cost. Now, a lot of times, you know, we'll be there talking about present value savings or future value savings. This is actually a cost. So when you see on the last bullet point, uh, the last error on section three, the future value cost to achieve this is estimated to be around $275,000. Because again, you're taking debt that wasn't going to mature in a year or two or three, and now pushing it out that it's going to mature in maybe four years from now or five years from now. So there again, there is a cost to do that. Um, but kind of the, the flip side of this is cash flow relief, which we'll get into uh, here in a few pages. Um, so that's the first option where we're just looking at refunding a portion of the series of 2012 bonds and uh, scooping it out a couple years and it has a present value cost of about 275000 Then in section four, uh, we were asked to do another, um, another scenario where now in the second point under uh, section four, so in addition to restructuring a portion of the series of 2012, um, we're also now looking at a portion of the 2015 Bs. And here now, um, we're, we're providing a little bit more relief in 21 year, 22 and 23. And now the debt's not being paid off until 2029. So it's being extended for a few more years. And that results in additional cost because now you're deferring that principal payback back uh, about four years longer than what it was in scenario one. So there the present value cost is about $412,000. So again, this is just kind of a high level summary. We'll get into a little bit more uh, of, the, of the scenarios here shortly. But uh, if, if everyone did want to move forward with this opportunity, 
you know, here we are this evening with the initial presentation, potentially an authorization to continue to move ahead. Um, we could be back on June 8th with your bond council to prepare a parameters resolution that you've seen many times before, <clears throat> and then actually pricing the bonds or potentially a bank loan in July to close in, in August. Uh, again, we would be looking at a dual track approach, again, similar to what we did in 2016 for that little restructuring. I ultimately did a bank loan. Um, so, you know, we look at both options. So the team, Ken and I, will be, um, you know, if you decide to proceed, we would send out an RFP to some of the local banks, see what kind of feedback we get, and then also compare that to a bond issue. There are some, the, the kind of the reason for the timeline, there are some time constraints if the district did want to pursue this, this opportunity. So we have settlement of this occurring in August, which is usually about a month or 30 days after we price the bonds or, or lock in the rate up for a bank loan. In order to realize the, the kind of the benefit that we're talking about here for these options, there is a principal payment in September for one of the issues that we're looking to refinance. So in order to achieve the, the benefit in the upcoming year, we'd have to close before you know, I'll, I'll say before Labor Day to achieve those results. So that's why the calendar is what it is um, to make sure that we would be able to close prior to that so the benefit could be realized. So those are kind of the main points. Uh, Bob, if you could go to the next page, please. Uh, this page here, many of you have seen before where it's the overall uh, outstanding indebtedness or debt summary uh, of the district. The two columns we have highlighted in yellow are the two different targets that we're looking at right now, the, the 2012s in column two and the 2015Bs in column three. The top portion of this is the gross debt service, which is the principal and interest that's due on a fiscal year basis. The bottom portion is what we'll call local effort requirements. That's the principal plus the interest, less the state reimbursement. So you see the numbers are a little bit less in each one of those uh, fiscal years. Um, and down below those columns, it gives you the kind of the plan con uh, percentage uh, reimbursement, whether or not it's permanent and, and the different call dates and, and what, they were, what they were used for. So again, those were the two candidates because they're the most efficient to, to, to look at because they're either passed or at the call date to achieve the restructuring that you know, we, we've been discussing. Bob, next page, please. So scenario one. So if we start up at the top uh, in column one, where it says a series of 2020, the par amounts about 3.44 million, we're funding a portion of the 2012 bonds. And what, the reason we keep saying a portion is whenever you do a restructuring or contemplate a restructuring, you only want to actually restructure what provides the benefit. You don't necessarily want to refund or you know kind of restructure or refund the rest of the of that particular bond issue if there's no savings related to it. You just end up paying fees on it and there's no benefit to the school district. So uh, we're saying here, you know, refund a portion of that. If you, know, you decide you want to move forward, whether it's a bank loan or bond issue, and we're actually able to refund more for actual savings, not to restructure more, but true savings, you know, maybe we would refund more. But uh, we're trying to keep it to a minimum to just to achieve the results <clears throat> that, that we're going to go through here. So column three, right below there, existing local, local effort. That matches the far right column of the, the, the prior page. So that's, the, that's what the school district is, is kind of the net payment that the school district is making right now after you know, the principal plus the interest after the state's reimbursement of its respective bond issues or note issues. That's what's labeled in, in column three, existing local effort. So if you did nothing, uh, and we have some, some illustrations um, uh, here in a few extra pages, but if, if the school district did nothing and just kind of continued on as is, that's what you would continue to pay on a fiscal year basis. So about um, you know, 9.1 million in the 2021 year, 7.8 for two years, then it drops down to about 5.2 million in the 23, 24 year, so on and so forth. Now with this option, the scenario one, in column four, is now showing the relief that we're obtaining by restructuring the portion of, of this particular bond issue. So be realizing about 947,000 of relief 
in the 2021 year, so in the upcoming fiscal year, about 680,000 in the following fiscal year, about 1.2 million of relief in the 22-23 year. And then you see, so the negative numbers in column four, that's the relief in those respective fiscal years. The positive numbers in the 24 and 25 year, that's now where the new principal is going. So basically, if you just sort of imagine, you're kind of carving out that debt in the next couple of years, and now you're, you're scooping it out and putting it out in years 24 and 25, mainly in 2025. So now in column five, that's the net payment that the district would, would make on a fiscal year basis if this scenario was the, the, the chosen one. So now you see basically uh, in the 2021 year, you're at about 8.2 million uh, and then about 7.2 million, 6.7, 5.3 and so forth. Um, so that again is, is scenario one. You see down in column four in the total, it shows the, the total cost to do that of $275,000. And again, that's because we're taking debt that was gonna mature in the next couple of years and, and moving it out into the 24, 25 year basically. So that's, that's scenario one. Scenario two, Bob, if you don't mind going to the next page, please. It, it looks, you know, the, the concept is, is, is very similar. So now up top in column one, now we're looking at doing both a portion of the 2012 bonds as well as a portion of the 2015B. Um, now, you know, column three is the same as the prior page. That's what you'd be paying if you just kind of continue on, on as is. Column four is now the relief that you would realize is completely Did we uh, lose audio there? Or is that me? No, I lost. I lost Mr. Shearer as well. I think he's frozen. This video is gone as well. Uh, I guess we'll wait until we see that. Mr. Saul, are you uh, familiar enough to, with the transaction to? Yeah, I, I'll try. I'll try to um, pick up where he um, where he left off. So, what he was describing was again this scenario in its fundamentally is similar in in the concept that it scoops out um, funds up front and pushes them uh, uh, later. So, if we focus on column five in this scenario, um, and you may recall that this uh, this Mr. Champagne had asked about a scenario like this at the last meeting, and so he certainly wanted to look at it. So you can see in column five that it, it offers more relief in, in the coming fiscal year 2021, um, okay. nearly $2 million of relief, and then, um, and then continues, you know, sort of the way Scott described in the previous one, you know, um, the only difference I would say, or the two big differences between this and the previous one is that from 21 to 22, you can see that it's level in terms of the uh, the payment amount. And then if you look, you can see it extends out um, in the 26, 27, 28, and 29 years. And did I hear Scott say he's back? Yep, I'm back. Thanks for covering sure. for me, Bob. Sure thing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Every hour on some days for literally like 30 seconds, uh, at, at like 52 minutes after the hour, I get booted at all. I, I don't understand what it is. So I, I apologize. I forgot to warn you before. It snuck up on me. My apologies. So, so, so yeah, that, that, those are the two main scenarios. And then Bob, do you want to kind of go to your graphs for, sure. I, I, I like looking at it in graph form as well. Um, so those, those scenarios before were, you know, kind of in the, in the number format. And now this, the, these next couple pages uh, show it more in, in the bar graph form where in the in the green that is uh the school district share and then in the gold color is the state share of the debt service payments basically and you know those those numbers basically match or you know those those uh, bar graphs match the prior pages as far as what the district's existing debt service currently is and then if you slide down this is what it would look like under scenario one you kind of see the declining payments and then scenario two 
again, you can kind of get a snapshot of, of what that what that looks like. So Scott, I'll just um, say again to the board members, um, you've seen this. We've looked at this type of chart several times. Actually, at the at the um, uh, previous board meeting, we looked at 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 chart one and chart two, and now you can see the addition of chart three. And and uh, as we talked about, between 2021 and 2022, you can see the payment remains uh, level, and then it sort of it decreases each year. Um, it's a level again in 23, 24 to 24, 25 and then steps down and a portion of that that was pushed out a um, million dollars. So it's a quarter million dollars per year was added to 25, 26, 27, 28. Um, actually, let me correct that. 26, 27, 28, and 29. Um, so with regard to the, the, the options, um, the administration recommends scenario number one, um, which was the scenario we had looked at um, previously. And again, I'll just share our thoughts. Um, it, it, one, it maintains the same final maturity date that we had with the original debt. Um, it doesn't extend it out quite as far. Um, it, it offers, it's attractive to us because of the way it steps down um, each year. And so it offers uh, relief if needed. However, I'll say that, you know, the, the idea is that, that that savings, if you will, each year is recommended to be redirected into capital reserve so we can fund our ongoing capital needs. But as a safety valve, um, there would be relief there to, to help us out in future budgets. And then finally, you know, it has a lower overall cost. Um, now, if you spread the additional cost out over the additional years, the cost per year is, is similar, um, but overall it, it, it does generate additional costs for the, the district. I'll also share that scenario one, um, has been built into the long range plan that stated for today that you it was made available to you for for demonstration purposes. Um, and what I will say is I've modeled scenario two. So if that is something that's preferred by the board, because you don't have that step down from 20, uh, 21 to 22, um, my recommendation would be to increase the contribution to capital reserve in the current year by an additional half million dollars in order to ensure that we're able to fund the projects that we have um, scheduled out. So that's sort of the impact of not having that step down in a future year is you really need to, to keep that in there this year. So while you would generate an additional million dollars of, of budget savings, my recommendation would be to, to redirect a half million dollars so you'd, you'd realize you'd actually realize about a half million dollars of additional savings uh, under the scenario that I would recommend with, with number two. So again, the administration is, is uh, recommending scenario one, we're, we're definitely recommending moving forward uh, to, to um, capture the relief that this will offer in our uh, upcoming budget. Scott, I sort of jumped in in front of you there. Did you have anything else to add? Nope, nope, great. nope, I think that was all great. Thank you. Well, I'll open it up to the board now for questions. I see uh, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, thank you for that presentation. It was it was well done and it made it real pretty clear. I do have a question though, um, just so that I'm I'm clear and I'm just curious. So while under both scenarios, but but in essence, since, since we're being recommended that we go with scenario one. Well, there are you know substantial cost savings in the in, in 21, 22, 23, there is a substantial increase um, in costs in 25. And if, if I heard you correctly, Mr. Saul, you said you know that the intent would be to put some of this money in capital reserves for future years and projects. And I guess my concern is if you know. The, the the $3 million pay, additional payment that we do in 25, you know, my concern would be that, you know, we're, we're paying a premium to get cost savings in three years and we end up using money to pay down this additional amount in 2025 that might not have otherwise been captured, uh, you know, in, in future budgets. And I wouldn't want to see us, you know, spending money to save money when, you know, it, it's almost circular. And, and I, I'm curious as to, you know, $3 million is $3 million when you, when you look for budgeting purposes and, you know, it, 
what what and you can't really foresee the future so uh, you know are we at risk of doing something that may cost us more in the future that we really didn't need to do had we kept kept you know had we not refinanced or restructured these bond issues sure. um i think there's there's always a an an unknown uh factor so could something occur in that year similar to this year where we would have pushed out some debt? Um, anything could happen. Um, but if you look at uh, if you if you look at the at the chart, we're we're really we're really at a similar payment as the as the prior year. And then the following year it would drop off. So Typically, those drop-offs are very nice if you have like a planned major capital project because you can dovetail your major capital project funding with the with the reduction in in debt service. Um, if it's if your major capital project is going to happen sooner, um, you, you you just have to structure you know work with Scott to structure the debt one way. If it happens a year or two later you redirect that into capital reserve to maintain capacity. So you maintain the, the capacity for those payments. Um, either way, I, I think from a, from a capital expenditure standpoint, I, I think we would be fine. Um, we, it's a matter of one year difference between when it now fall, quote, reduces or falls off to the, where it would fall off under this scenario. Right. Um, I don't think, I don't think that is um, significantly tying the hands uh, of a future board or administration. Um, I think if we were to take all of our debt and make it step down consistently year after year from now until eight years from now, that may be a little bit different. Um, or if you made your le debt level for the next eight years, I think that might be different. But here we're really just, you know, we're adjusting one year. Um, and I think, we're in unprecedented times. I, I don't know any of my uh, colleagues who've been in this industry or anybody who can remember a similar, um, a similar sort of economic occurrence that mirrors this where it came on us so quickly and you had, you know, sort of had to figure out how to, how to resolve that. So I think given the, again, us unprecedented economic uh, circumstances, I think in my opinion, this is a very reasonable um, approach uh, for uh, for getting some upfront relief. Yeah, and Bob, <coughs> Bobby, <coughs> excuse me, just to add on to that a little bit. So where that in scenario one, where the three million dollar payment kind of now occurs in the 24, 25 year, where it, it was going to your payment was going to be about you know 2.1 million, and now under this scenario in the 24, 25 year, it's 5.1 million, which is pretty much in line with the the preceding year. That's something that the state looks at very closely when we have to file all the paperwork with them for them for the state to approve for DCD and that there's no big balloon payment um, that's going to burden the, the taxpayers of the school district. So it needs to fit kind of within the overall puzzle of your debt portfolio. And this does. So again, there's no, there's no like increase in your debt service. As, as Bob mentioned in the 24 year, it's at 5.3 million. And now in the 24, 25 year, it'd be about 5.2 million. Um, so the state looks very closely to make sure, you know, that wouldn't go up to say 8 million in that year. That would not be feasible to do. Um, and, you know, I, I will say, obviously, being with the school district now for, for many years, ha having this option, you know, because of kind of the good fiscal policies and management and board decisions over the years, your debt portfolio is in kind of in a very good position to be able to entertain this idea to provide kind of cash flow relief in these uncertain times at, at a very efficient cost. I mean, we have other districts right now and, and other cities and townships and boroughs that are looking at doing something similar. And instead of a couple hundred thousand dollar cost, it's millions and millions of dollars because of the way the debt is structured and they don't have that uh, kind of that luxury of, of your nice short debt portfolio with these step downs. So, you know, when comparing to, to other peers out there, you are able to entertain this idea uh, at, at, again, a very efficient and reasonable cost to be able to provide this cash flow relief. Well, uh, what, and, and that goes kind of leads into my next two, final two questions, Mr. Scheer. Um, one, how is the bond market impacted by, by the current economic situation? And, you know, 
is is there a strong market out there that you foresee? I mean, you know, the market had a great response to the stock exchange reopening today. Um, I mean, do you see the bond market being strong and stable going forward? I mean, it, it, is there money out there for this? You hear different things about, you know, some banks are having trouble, um, you know, meeting funding obligations or they're not willing to, to lend, you know, large amounts. And then, you know, together with that, you know, your assume rate of 2%. Um, I mean, do you think that, you know, I'm not, now this is, I'm asking you to look into your crystal ball, but, you know, we're talking two plus months down the road for when we would settle if this goes through. And again, you know, what, where, 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 where are projections right now with interest rates? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem like they can go much lower than they already are. Um, but, you know, who knows what, what the Federal Reserve is going to do next. But Right, right. You know, no, good, good, good question. So, so the bond market and, and the bank loan market, I, I would say, were both kind of shut down in early March. There was no supply, no demand. Everyone was just kind of waiting to see what was, what was going to happen. Um, here we are now towards the end of May. I would say that the market opened up pretty re real well, uh, you know, maybe mid-April uh, is when we were starting to see more deals happen. Uh, and, and it started with the better credits. Um, East Penn is very good credit rating. Um, so this one would uh, be very attractive for investors and for banks. So the short answer is yes, the markets are back open. Uh, we've been doing uh, quite a few deals today. I just did one for an A-rated city out in the Western part of the state. Um, and that went absolutely fine. We've been just, our firm itself has been doing maybe about in, in, in the Harrisburg office, about six a week. Um, RBC, I know Ken would be able to speak. They're doing about the same amount of volume as well. So the, the short answer is investors are, are interested again uh, and they're getting done. Our, our big concern was that's great uh, when the market opens that back up, but will they open back up at, I'll call pre-COVID levels? And the answer is yes. Uh, we were kind of very uh, pleased seeing the results right out of the gates when things open back up that, you know, we're seeing deals getting done where they would have been getting done, say, back in February before the market, um, the, the kind of the overall situation had occurred. And it's the same with the, with the banks. So like I said, we'd be doing a dual track for about a month. A lot of the smaller banks were very preoccupied with the PPP program. They were more focused on that and not so much at the municipal level. Well, you know, that program kind of been taken care of and they're back in action as well. So I, I would say very confidently that both markets are, are back open, both the bank loan market and the bond issue. As far as rates, where we see them going, um, I, I think that they're going to probably stick around in this neighborhood for you know quite some time. I mean, there's the day-to-day -day volatility in the bond market, just like we see in the stock market. Um, but overall, I think we're going to see it probably stay around um, around this level. So yeah, we would have if you if you moved according to that timeline, you know, we would have um, you know about a month and a half or so of interest rate risk. And that's something that we would keep Bob up to date with if you did decide to move forward with the parameters resolution at your next meeting. We kind of share updates with the numbers with him as we get closer to, to the time we are actually able to execute to make sure things are still in line with what we're seeing today. But I don't foresee any kind of major, major swing one way or another. So would we have until that you know, settlement date to pull out if, for example, the rates, something happened in the rates, shot up and it didn't become well it you basically have until the pricing date uh, and the pricing date i think we were assuming would, was sometime in july so once we actually lock in the rate whether it's through a bond issue or through a bank loan uh at that point a bond purchase agreement or bank loan commitment will be needed to be signed by the board president at that point in time so that's kind of the the decision point that that's really when your interest rate risk stops is at that point and then for the, for the next 30 days thereafter, it's a lot more of the paperwork, getting everything filed with the state, having them approve it, and getting the closing papers in, in order. So really your interest rate risk stops when, when we actually price the bonds or, or lock in the rate via the bank loan. 
Thank you. That's all and I have. Just to clarify on the timing, uh, I saw we'll have a, um, a parameters uh, resolution at the next board meeting in June uh, 8th, and that's when the board will say, as long as the deal meets these parameters, you have the freedom to go ahead and price it. If it goes out of those parameters, then they won't, they won't right. do the deal. That's right. That's right. So we have some limits we can place on it, even without being there at the pricing to, That's right. to, to make That's a right. decision. That's right. Dr. Munson, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. And, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I had one follow-up question um, that uh, was touched on briefly last meeting. But for, for those of us who are not um, following the bond markets as closely as you are, I'm, I'm curious why the interest rates for these bonds, the expected rate for these bonds are so high relative to the federal discount rate um, as compared to what we were paying on past bond refinancing. It seems like the rate hasn't gone down nearly as much. Yeah, so the, so what the Fed controls is basically the overnight rate. So that's what they, that's what they drop. So it's basically the, the, the overnight the, or the one day rate, if you will. Um, what we're talking about here is, you know, whether it's five year debt or, or nine year debt, kind of depending on which option is chosen. So yes, they definitely have gone down. They just haven't gone down quite as quite, quite as much as what the Fed did, just because if you think about the, the, the yield curve, um, sort of the natural shape and, and theory behind the yield curve is the shorter the duration, the lower the rate. So as you, you know, you start with you know, day one, your rate should be the lowest. And then when you get to say year one, your rate went up a little bit. Year two, your rate goes up a little bit more to compensate for the risk factor over, the, over, over time. Um, and so the, the actual rate itself, you know, we won't know until we lock it in. I would say, you know, if we did, based on some of the bank loans that we've been doing recently, I would think the bank loan uh, rate is going to be less than the 2%. So the thing that we have to factor in when we go down that dual track approach is looking at both rates and cost. So typically a bank loan will have a lower rate uh, and uh, lower, well, let me, let me back up. A bank loan typically has lower costs that are, that are paid at closing, but sometimes they may have a higher rate. A bond issue typically has higher cost and a lower rate. So we have to look at both of those together to make sure that the district is ultimately getting the best deal out there. And so that's why we would, we would look at, you know, kind of both options and we're not, uh, we have no vested interest in which option is, is chosen. So I think if we would do it today, it, the rate would be a little bit lower. Okay, great. Um, the another question um, between the two scenarios. I know um, that from past presentations that you've made to the board that all of the numbers um, that you have in the charts and so forth are net of the fees and 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 costs associated with the transaction. Um, but I'm curious if those costs and fees differ between the two scenarios, or are those essentially the same across the two? No, they would be uh, a little bit more for the bond issue. Um, so yeah, they, they would. There's more work, a um, little bit more time, a little bit more work involved in the bond issue. A few more parties are involved um, with with a bond issue. For instance, a bond issue, you got to go through the credit rating process. A bank loan, we do not. So you know that's an that's an extra cost and some some time as well. So there there is a difference. But yeah, the, it, everything is netted out of uh, what with the numbers that we're reflecting here uh, in, in these scenarios. Assume a bank loan. Okay, and what about, um, I'm curious about the flexibility that we will have moving forward with this debt. As I recall in, in past presentations, there's been another chart that provides more details on the individual um, series. Um, maybe I'm misremembering, but so I'm curious, for example, the on, um, I guess it's page two of your presentation, it's column five, the, 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 series, the 2018 bond series, which is about 16 million. Um, when, when does that become callable? And, and how long will we be locked in? Will we be ever, will we be ever able to reconsider or rethink the, um, the debt that we would be restructuring in this transaction? And if so, when would that be? Yep, no, good question. So uh, the 2019 bonds, that we did um, 
that had basically a seven-year call feature. So they're callable in 2026. The 18 bonds, because of the size and the duration, they were non-callable. Um, now for this, if we do a bank loan, um, we would stipulate that it needs to be prepayable at any time uh, with no penalty. Now that's what we put, uh, put in, the, in the documents. Um, some of the banks will adhere to that and submit a proposal that's conforming. Others will say, hey, here's, here's a great rate. Here's, you know, I'm just making up a number. Here's a rate of one and a half percent, but you, maybe it's non-callable or maybe it's only non-callable for three years as opposed to the full maturity. And that's something we weigh in our decision ma making of which has the best option. Now the bond issue, the bond issue will have a five-year call feature on it, which is typical for a bond issue less than 10 million. Typically anything less than 10 million, you have a five-year call feature. Anything over 10 million, you have a six or seven or eight or 10-year call feature. Um, so scenario one is basically about a five-year transaction. So okay. we, we may be able to put, you know, like a four-year call or four and a half-year call on it. Um, we're just gonna have to sort of take the temperature of the investors. For scenario two, we would we would be able to put a five-year call feature on it. So yeah, no, great question. Uh, and that's something we look at very closely to make sure we're given the district the future flexibility to refinance in the future or to contemplate another one of these kind of restructurings if, if need be. I mean, chances are, I mean, never gonna say never, but if we're able to lock in a rate via a bond issue or a bank loan, um, you know, right now at say less than 2%, it, it's probably going to be pretty hard to refinance in the future for savings, but at least it would give you the opportunity to, to, um, to restructure, uh, you know, a similar transaction like this. So yeah, we, we will look at that very closely. Great. Thank you. Um, and then the last thing was just a quick comment. Um, uh, you know, in looking at these materials uh, in preparation for the meeting, it, I had, it, the, the, the first scenario looked the, the most attractive to me for many of the reasons that Mr. Saul said. And so I was glad that this was also the administration's um, recommendation as well. So thank you for the presentations. Great. Thank you. Dr. Levinson. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for, for preparing these, uh, the, these two choices. Um, I guess go, going into today's discussion, I'll admit that I actually was leaning more towards scenario two. Um, and, you know, when, when after hearing uh, Mr. Saul's uh, um, points about the advantages of scenario one, I can certainly appreciate where, where you're coming from in terms of seeing the praises for, for what scenario one can do. Uh, but, but again, I, I, I'm still left with, with the idea that there might be some advantages to, to moving or to, to utilizing scenario two, um, you know, some things to consider are that scenario two does provide a fair amount of additional flexibility for what we can do in the 2021 school year. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I, I think part of what needs to be considered here is, is not only, you know, how these scenarios impact the financial balance sheet, but also uh, you know, what, what, uh, what are the programmatic benefits or impacts of doing one over the other? Um, you know, an additional million dollars going into, into next year, you know, I, I can appreciate why, we, why Mr. Saul suggested putting a little more toward the capital. Again, we want capital reserve because we want to do things down the road. But having that additional, those additional monies you know, might be attractive for providing a little extra relief on, on making some of the the, the bad versus worse choices in terms of, uh, you know, what it is we want to do programmatically. Um, I'll also note that the, I mean, I looked at the primary difference between scenario one and scenario two as, as, as getting an extra million dollars of flexibility for, quote, only another $140,000, which is spread out in, in the balance of the final four years. Um, to me, that seems like a pretty good, a good balance. Um, I'll also note that the the refinancing that we did last year freed up, you know, four hundred some thousand dollars and change. Uh, the, the the majority of which I think we were able to take during this this year. Uh, and if you look at that on a discounted cash flow basis, you know that that certainly had has greater value than than the. 
$413,000. That's earmarked for scenario number two. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, again, in the absence of uh, financial issues, I wouldn't want to be restructuring at all to pay these additional fees. But, but I do think that, that I don't, I don't know if we should dismiss scenario number two yet w without thinking, or, 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 or at least I want to hear some more information from the administration as to what flexibility can be had by having an additional half million to a million dollars, you know, be contributing to to this coming year's budget. Uh, and, and, and again, to uh, you know, maybe help to 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 uh, offset some of the uh, you know the serious programmatic things that we have to consider. Oops, are you looking for a response right now, or just yes, yes. Yeah, I would. I would like to to hear hear something maybe. Maybe from uh, Mrs. Campbell. Uh, I don't know if, if you're prepared to speak on that topic. Um, um, I think your question, in essence, in in some ways, will be not directly but indirectly addressed as we begin to look at our budget process um, for the budget presentation regarding the, the proposed final budget. And so throughout tonight's presentation, we have some additional information that we learned um, late last week that we've added to the presentation to share with the board and the community, um, as well as potentially reflecting on some of the initial reductions that were proposed as part of phase one and providing the board with some initial feedback regarding reprioritizing some of those um, reductions that potentially were originally that, that were originally introduced. I, 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 I recognize that there are, there are other things in play at, the, at this point. I, I just think that um, again, may, maybe this will be discussed a bit more when we get into the next phase of our discussion tonight, uh, but you know, I, I do think that uh, you know, those additional funds for the, the, the trade-off that's there in terms of the additional cost and, and what looks like you know, similar payments through, through the next you know, eight, eight to 10 years you know, might be worth taking. So, so again, I, I just wanted to make sure that, that I expressed that and, and maybe you know, other members of this panel might, uh, um, you might also want to comment on it. So. Yeah, and I, I appreciate, Ms. Uh, Dr. Levinson, the perspective in terms of looking at how the additional savings in the 2020-21 might be used by the school district. I think, I think we saw with regard to scenario one versus scenario two, also potentially um, not looking just at a single year and how those savings may help us in a year, but also looking to future years and trying to be sure that we're being mindful about the long-term financial health of the district and not necessarily setting us up for a situation in the future where we have a significant change in a debt payment. Okay, I guess I just didn't, didn't see, is it, what, is it, which, which year is the one that you're most concerned with then? Was it um, about the jump? I'll share that my concern is um, I've heard an, a number of people, and, and this is, a, I guess, an unqualified opinion uh, by many people, but indicate that, quote, next year is going to be worse than this year. So I'm concerned about taking an additional $1 million this year to fund our budget that is not necessarily sustainable into next year's budget. Um, and we haven't given ourselves relief uh, by a step down in debt service. Um, so it's, it's the first two years that particularly concern me of um, just taking additional, uh, additional savings up front that, that isn't necessarily going to be sustainable, if that makes sense. I, I think it does. Uh, that's an aspect that I, I didn't think too much about. Um, all right. I'll mull on and, that for a little bit. And I'll just I'll, I'll clarify, while the million dollars is sustainable because the debt service doesn't go up, yeah. The, the, the cost that we're building into the budget will go up, right? Because typically if you, 
if you're funding something with a million dollars and it's a recurring cost, the cost is probably going to go up. So you're, you're right. building an increase on top of that. And so my concerns really are, as I said, in the, in these first two years, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be sure the district is set up to not only deal with the problems this year, but okay. the quote next year is going to be worse. Okay. All right. I can appreciate that. Um, all right. I just, I just want to make sure I, 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 I express that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Winch. Hi, I, um, I actually had a lot of the same thoughts that um, Mr. Levinson had, Dr. Levinson had. I do like the idea of the flexibility. Um, thinking about next year having being a bigger problem than this year, could we allocate half of those savings or the restructuring of that second million to next year's budget potentially um, at the cost savings of about 50% had we done this, uh, had if we were to do this again next year. Um, and that's what I was thinking if we're paying four point or four four hundred twenty five thousand dollars for one million or for two million as opposed to two seventy five for one million it makes sense to take on those charges now and maybe help for the next two years and just give us a little bit more flexibility especially when we don't know what's going on with legislation legislation 100 percent if i'm making it all any uh, any sense but i just want to say i i i have full faith in and bob and he probably had or mr saul and he probably understands this better than i do but i share some of the the thoughts that um dr levinson has as well just a clarification you're only speaking about next year's benefit it's actually 2.9 million versus 3.8 million that we're talking about in the two scenarios, I think. Because um, it's over it, the, the next three years of relief we're getting. So we're getting a one a relief in the 21 budget of roughly a million, yeah. right? And then, in, and then, but in scenario two, we're getting a, a cost savings of almost 2 million in the 21 budget, but I'm thinking if we're, if it's a possibility that we might have to, or if we're in a worse scenario next year, and if we're looking at ways to save money next year, this might be a better time to take the larger lump of a debt service reduction or restructuring at a lower fee than let's say we were to do this again next year, it, it would save us money um, because at, for $1 million in savings, we're talking about $275 for an additional 130, 140, we're getting twice as much. So I don't know if you can move debt savings from one year to another, but it's just a thought of the more flexibility. I think you're just looking at the next year, but the, both plans have savings for the next three years in them. And that's no, I, under, I, do under, I do understand that, but it's not nearly, it's not as significant. Well, but, okay. Okay, moving on to Mr. Champagne. Yes, um, I appreciate the efforts that uh, Mr. Shear and, and Bob have put together the, the information. I guess when I, when I suggested looking at this, I was trying to kind of maybe always put Kind of bookends on what we might consider. And the reason I was looking at it this way is that we don't have all the other pieces of the puzzle put together at this point. And I guess what I would like the, the administration to consider here is to hold judgment on whether it's scenario one or scenario two until we see all the pieces of the puzzle. And re with respect to are we going to have a 1.5% tax increase? Are we going to have something less than that? Uh, what other savings options do we have? And I, and I do appreciate Mr. Saul's concerns about this coming year not necessarily being the worst year. It could be the following year that really uh, is, is more uh, of a problem, especially if the Act 1 index you know, goes down substantially or other things happen that are beyond our control in, in the state budgets and so forth. So I guess what I... And I, so I do appreciate Mr. Saul's concern. It's more than just a single year. 
Uh, and I would just like us to, before we kind of lock in on a particular scenario, we have all the pieces of the puzzle in front of us so that we can look at the trade-offs that we have to make um, and not just say, you know, this is the path we go. I think either path is doable and I would support either one, but in absence of seeing all the other things that we have to consider and how we put them together so that we deal with programs, we deal with you know, other, uh, other issues that we face. Um, let's res I would like us to see, kind of let's, re let's reserve on this until we know all of the, the ins and outs. And then I think we can make a better you know, uh, you know, assessment of what scenario makes the most sense. Or it's some hybrid like Mr. Saul considered, which is take you know, 500,000 of that savings that we might see in scenario two put it in capital reserve to give us a little cushion going into the, the following year. Thank you. I don't see anyone else with hands. I have a few comments. Um, when reviewing this beforehand, I, I, um, I was glad to see, to hear also the administration is uh, uh, in favor of scenario one. I would say my biggest concern is, is the next year's budget. I, I think there's, an implicit um, assumption in scenario two that next year's not going to be uh, as bad, and I don't think that's the case. I think it will be worse, and I think we'll want the built-in relief that um, scenario one uh, saves us. Um, I would rather, rather than thinking about what else we could do with the extra half a million to one million dollars this year, I would be very concerned using that um uh this year uh considering what is likely to be coming next year and i would rather take the pain this year and get our finances in order so we have the flexibility to address um next year built into the budget um i i also think probably because scenario two pushes the debt out further it's it's actually um a bit more expensive it's uh uh, if you look at it, the, the doubt amount of savings we get in the in the early years versus the cost, it's it's a little higher, uh, not not huge, but a, uh, it's about a ten percent higher rate in terms of the the amount we're we're pushing out versus the cost of the push out. So I, I would be strongly I'd be in favor of scenario one, but would be very concerned about uh, going down scenario two. Um, even if we were we were st stuck at uh, one and a half percent tax increase, I might feel differently if the tax increase was closer to the index. But um, having been in a uh, scenario where we're trying to catch up and are limited by Act One, um, I don't want to repeat that, and I'd be very concerned about um, getting getting behind things using using. Uh, additional funding this year uh, and putting us in a hole for next year. So, are there any other comments from board members before we proceed? Okay, moving on to the budget update. And while you're pulling this up, uh, if I can just, if Scott's still on, thank you, uh, Scott, for joining us this evening uh, for this presentation. We appreciate it. You bet. So, yeah, so Bob, we'll, you. Just we'll just touch base tomorrow morning then? Yes, thank you. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. You bet. Take care now. Is someone on mute or is that me? Mrs. Campbell, I think you're still muted. Well, that upsets me because you missed a really dynamo introduction. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We'll um, just imagine it. Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, just a reminder that we are um, on target for 
an update and a vote on our final budget coming up for the June 8th meeting. And this evening's meeting really is a special meeting of the board specifically focused on the budget and where we're at at this point in the process. So as a reminder for the board, as well as our community members who are joining us this evening, um, our, our budget for the 2020-21 school year is um, with a five point with a 1.5 percent tax increase we have a six million dollar budget deficit and as many of you know administration has been working for the past several weeks to reduce that the expenditures this slide summarizes information that we also shared with the board at our last meeting specifically in an attempt to begin to reduce that $6 million budget deficit, we began to look at all areas of the budget and identify some potential reductions. Um, these initial reductions were presented to the board as part of phase one. And you'll hear us speak later to the presentation in terms of as we have had additional time to look at areas of reducing expenditures, some of the items that were potentially presented as sort of phase one would not necessarily be the initial priority or recommendation of areas that we would cut. And again, we'll speak a bit more in detail about that as we get to um, later in the presentation. But for purposes of, at the time, looking at positions that we had available in terms of retirements or resignations and not necessarily filling positions through attrition, some of those staffing reductions were recommended at that point in time. So you also heard this evening a bit more detail in terms of the restructuring and potential savings from there. So in total, the recommended reductions for the initial phase that was presented to the board was about $3.9 million. It is common at this point in the school year and as part of the budget development process that administration would continue to adjust revenues as well as expenditures based on the most updated information that we have. And so Mr. Saul is gonna spend just a few minutes speaking to this particular side, which slide, which is again, a common practice that administration would follow at this point in the budget process. So we're identifying these as some additional phase one or initial adjustments that we were able to reflect in the budget. Great, thank you, yeah. So first is um, real estate tax. Uh, we've talked about this, I think, a number of times through, the, through the, the process, but each month the county assessment office sends us an updated assessment report reflecting the total uh, taxable assessed value of uh, all properties in the school district. And generally we see a little bit of growth in that each month um, because we see development uh, out in the community, uh, real estate development in the community. And so there's just sort of a natural uh, growth in, in this area. So the 58,000 represents additional assessment growth um, that was reflected on the May 10th, 2020 um, uh, report from the Lycoming County Office of Assessment. Uh, next, uh, labeled as breakage, uh, represents the savings between the salary and benefit package for a resigning or retiring uh, employee and the estimated um, um, cost for the replacement employee. So we've looked at uh, all of the retirements that have been approved by the board. And you may, you'll recall that some of those were in the phase one recommendations um, to not be uh, uh, replaced. But the other ones, um, we have estimated the savings uh, between the, again, the retiring employee and, and where we estimate the new hires. The, the next two items, um, the property insurance package and the workers' compensation insurance, uh, recall, if you will, that uh, at the previous board meeting, the May 11th board meeting, um, you approved the, the uh, property insurance package and, and the insurances for next year. And so we know what the actual cost will be. Uh, and so these represent budgetary savings. So early in the budget process, we meet with our insurance broker and we ask uh, them for estimates, you know, where they see the market going. And we, we try to adjust those, the, the uh, premiums early in the budget process. So we have, um, we're not experiencing a, a cost increase late in the budget process. So 
when these actually uh, came up with the, the final renewal figures, uh, we realized budgetary savings. Um, the workers' compensation insurance, uh, that's significant. Again, last year, we went with a new workers' compensation carrier. Um, they have been very good working with the district, and we have kept our premiums low. So we actually um, had a cushion in there because we didn't know if the the carrier maybe was buying down buying the business the first year and offered a super low premium in year one um, to get the business and then would increase premiums, but that didn't happen. We can see that premiums are have remained at a, a nice low level with that particular uh, workers' compensation carrier. And then finally, um, the LCTI tuition recall at a previous meeting that Mr. Champagne uh, described to us that the um, uh, LCTI is refunding, returning some funds um, to help offset the tuition increase that we will experience for next year. So we certainly wanted to capture those funds as a, as a cost savings as well. So again, these are things that we would ordinarily look at uh, an update through the budget process. And here they represented uh, $427,000 of, of additional savings. So as part of our continued work on the budget, um, we then identified additional expenditures which we could potentially reduce for the 2020-21 budget. And those additional reductions are reflected in this table, which we've identified as phase two, which is again, from a timing perspective, we were now able to further investigate other areas of the budget. Um, in the first one, when we look at further staffing reductions, we had some additional vacancies in positions. And so then, as we always do, we analyze all those positions and determine the feasibility or the impact of not filling those positions through attrition. And so this next round of potential staffing reductions includes a possible reduction of a health room support staff, a reduction of a maintenance position, as well as an instructional specialist position. Again, those would all potentially be not filled through attrition. In terms of transportation savings, transportation is certainly an area of the budget that we continue to analyze for potential savings. And we identified that we were able to consolidate a parochial and charter school runs for a, an approximate savings of $100,000 annually. And that really is a result of being able to consolidate some runs. So instead of having potentially two different buses that were servicing multiple schools, we were able to serve those um, with a single bus. The board at our previous meeting had also mentioned continuing to look at contracted services as an area in which we could realize some potential savings. And so we have identified a copier contract with an anticipated savings of about $10,000. And then another area of potential savings, again, we, we certainly are trying to look first at non-instructional areas. Um, and so we have proposed that we would reduce the number of after-school clubs and activities that are offered at each of our secondary buildings. So our middle schools and our high schools each have approximately between 40 to 50 after-school clubs and activities that certainly are a valuable part of our secondary students' overall educational experience. Um, those are optional activities for students interest-driven often. Um, and so our initial proposal is that we would reduce the number of offerings at each building by approximately 10 in each building, which you could see there is a projected savings of about 15,000. So when we look at this next round of potential savings, you'll see the total of about 370,000. And this slide really captures where we are up to this point in terms of just a quick reminder of the original deficit with a 1.5% tax increase. The reductions, if indeed we implemented all of the reductions that we've identified so far throughout phase one and phase two, and then that leaves a remaining deficit of about 1.27%.
we had um, some, some information that we learned about late in the week last week um, that certainly has had and will have a significant impact on the path that our budget takes, I believe, from this point forward. In particular, I, I am really proud to share that we received information from two of our labor groups that they have agreed to take a salary freeze for the 2020-21 school year. In particular, the board and administration received a verbal commitment from the East Penn Education Association, which represents our professional staff, as well as a verbal commitment from Act 93, which includes all of our administrators in the district. And they are willing to work with East Penn to help address the budget deficits by accepting a salary freeze for the upcoming budget cycle. We are incredibly fortunate to be a part of an educational community in which our professional staff, as well as our administrators, truly in this case, have joined us as partners in education. They care about the quality of services that they offer our students, and equally as important, they are committed to preserving those high quality programs through all means that are available. Our professional staff and our administrators truly recognize that they play a critical role in the stability of our classrooms, in the stability and growth of our buildings, and they also play a critical role in our community. And so I, I just, I know that some of them are actually joining the meeting this evening as attendees, and I wanted to publicly recognize and thank them for working with us through this process. So you can see that this has a tremendous impact on our budget. And so the estimated savings from the concessions of our professional staff is about $1.4 million. And then our administrators, the savings to the district for the upcoming school year is about $180,000. And you can see that results then in an additional savings of about $1.6 million for the 2020-21 budget. Administration recommends that we would restore some of the instructional positions. Specifically, you might recall back in phase one, we mentioned reduction of elementary classroom positions, all of which had an impact on class size. And so we would potentially restore one of those elementary classroom positions, as well as in phase two, we've identified a specialist position. We would also prefer, administration would recommend maintaining that position, as these are positions that directly impact the quality of instructional programs that we're able to deliver in East Penn. As per the board's request, administration, again, recognizing that at our previous meeting in May, we were at a much different situation than we are right now, um, and that the, the budget process truly is something that evolves over time. The board and administration um, decided that we would continue to look at additional areas of reduction in the event that they are necessary. And so I will share with you that these reductions do begin to substantively impact our instructional programs as well as our extracurricular programs. And so if necessary, ways in which we would further reduce the budget would be to look at um, possibly eliminating after school clubs and activities completely at the secondary level and or even further reducing them beyond just the, the 10 that we're proposing as part of phase two. We would then potentially also look at transportation for those after school clubs and activities and potentially um, eliminate all transportation for after school clubs and activities. We're fortunate in East Penn that that is a service that we're able to provide to our students in an attempt to provide all students with the opportunity to equitably access those clubs and activities that meet after school. We'd also, and this is something that we certainly continue to do, continue to analyze those private parochial charter school runs to determine if there are additional savings. Some of that information may not be completely finalized until we get into the summer when those schools report back to us what their enrollments are. And finally, there are additional staffing positions. Um, we have some, we have retirements um, that as of now, we are recommending that we fill those positions. 
but should there be a need to, um, if those positions were not filled through attrition, that would potentially impact our elementary support staff. So these are, these are specifically some support staff positions that work with students and provide interventions and additional academic support to them. And there are also high school retirements that we could potentially look at. Again, um, without going into too much detail, I can share with the board that administration has, has strong reservations about any further staffing reductions because those would without a doubt impede our ability to continue to maintain and offer students at Emmaus High School the high quality programs and choices that they currently have. And finally, as part of our update tonight, Mr. Saul is going to revisit the property tax rebate program, which we've had some great discussion about over the course of our budget presentations, and specifically share with you the administrative recommendation regarding the seniors, uh, the property tax rebate program. Thank you. Yes, uh, as you recall, we did discuss this um, at a previous board meeting, and there was uh, there was a fair amount of feedback. Uh, in fact, I actually had to go back and, and re-watch and re-listen to the feedback just to be sure I had a, a grasp on the, um, um, the information that was shared by board members that evening. Uh, I can tell you that when I watched it, of those who, who shared their uh, sentiments about the program, um, it was a 50-50 split in terms of um, supporting the program one way or another. Uh, so it really came down to um, I think recommending what administration feels strongly about uh, in terms of the program. So with the first bullet point, um, there was quite a bit of sentiment about, uh, shared about not increasing the program uh, limits too high, i.e., you know, um, increasing the amount of money it would cost to implement the, the changes. So we brought back a, a recommendation of a small increase. It would be hopefully the first step of, of a number of increases maybe over the next few years, uh, increasing the maximum household income from 20,000 to 22,000. And that would then attract uh, some additional um, um, re, uh, potential refunds. Uh, second, uh, something that was a bit more controversial, um, we are uh, again recommending that we align the program the East Penn School District program with the Commonwealth of, of uh, Pennsylvania property tax re, uh, rent rebate program income ranges, which are listed at the bottom of the uh, of the slide here. And then finally, again, we we recommend continuing expansion of the of the program in in um, future years. If I can just touch on the second bullet point, uh, just uh, for another comment, you know, certainly I recognize. Um, uh, the thoughts and concerns that were shared with regard to um, changing this and there there will be people who receive less of a refund um, but i I have to go back to um, you know the administration was char was charged with uh, taking a look at the program and and bringing back a, a set of recommendations with regard to to this program and so we again feel strongly that consistency um, is very important so uh, this is the recommendation, and again, there's a, the, the updated handout that reflects um, all of the data be, behind this recommendation. So I will say that as, as you can all appreciate, our budget process continues to evolve. We've certainly made some sharp left turns, I'm going to say about, um, about six to eight weeks ago with regard to the the budget that we were bringing forward to the board. Our goal this evening is really to be, to listen to your feedback, specifically regarding the proposed reductions that have been shared so far. Um, feedback as well on the debt restructuring, we appreciate those comments. And then also any further feedback regarding the tax rebate program. So that at the June 8th meeting, when we bring forth a final budget, we can bring you a budget that is reflective and based on your feedback, as well as that includes our perspective in terms of the educational and the financial needs of the organization as well. So certainly we welcome your feedback questions that you might have. Uh, Mr. Smith. Yes, first, um, uh, thanks for um, 
uh, will be willing to put together a, a another budget update. I'm sure that um, it's uh, uh, it's appreciated by me. I'm sure it's appreciated by members of the community as well. Um, before I get into a couple questions, um, I just wanted to first express my deep gratitude uh, to both the East Penn teachers and the administration. Um, I know that the decision to accept a pay freeze was not an easy one to make, but it shows your commitment to keeping strong educational opportunities for our students. But it also shows the level of connection that you have to the pulse of the community that you serve. In a time when many in the community are, new, are newly unemployed, underemployed, or struggling financially, you've really demonstrated your ability to uh, both listen and connect to the members of the community. So thank you for that. Um, I had two quick questions. Um, in uh, taking a look at the two phases, uh, in phase one, there was uh, a mention of the breakage, uh, and in phase two, there was a mention of staffing, further staffing reductions. Does the breakage, and I'm, I'm guessing it's probably not reflected, but does the, the breakage in phase one that's mentioned in phase one reflect the staffing reductions that are in phase two? Mr. Saul, or I think you're muted. Something was in front of it in that corner, so I apologize. Um, that's an excellent observation, Mr. Smith, and that, that very well could be um, an oversight on my part because I, I, believe, um, I believe that the breakage, the savings uh, number with breakage could be reflective of some, I would say probably not all, but some of the staffing reductions listed in phase two. Okay. Um, and then the second question that I had uh, on slide eight, I believe it was, um, going to the administration's recommendations about the uh, elementary and specialist teacher. Those are positions that are currently slated to be cut through attrition, correct? And not, not new positions. So these, th this would be a measure of continuing what we already have in place, not adding something new, correct? Absolutely. Um, and I appreciate you bringing up that point. All of the proposed reductions are through attrition and there are no new positions that are represented in this budget. Great. Thank you. I'll actually, I'll actually clarify no new positions or programs that are represented in this budget. Okay. Uh, moving on. Are you I assume you're done, uh, Mr. Smith. Moving on to Dr. Levinson. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, before I get into my, um, my comments and questions, uh, I would like to echo the sentiments that uh, Mr. Smith made, uh, specifically you know, expressing my sincere gratitude to the East Bend Education Association and our Act 93 employees for making substantial wage concession, which as we can see, if we start comparing the numbers, it is, it's gonna be doing a lot to, to help us close that gap. Uh, so again, I'm truly grateful for that. And, uh, you know, again, I, I agree with what Mr. Smith said that, you know, just show that, that you care very much for, for uh, our students in addition to, uh, you know, being well-connected to the, to the needs of our community. Um, so with that, I'd also like to, to express my gratitude to the administration for continuing to work on the, on the budget and coming up with, uh, uh, you know, again, some you know, reasonable ideas in order to, uh, you know, again, help, help trim, trim expenses uh, where they make sense without having, you know, uh, you know highly significant uh, you know, impacts on, on instruction and then, and then going back and revisiting those assumptions to try and find something that goes back. Uh, so where I would like to, uh, to spend my, my comments now uh, is on the, the aspect of, of what's been proposed for the property tax reduction program. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, this is something that's very important to me, you know, having uh, you know, brought up the motion last December and uh, you know, expressing it in, in, in great detail uh, what the motivation is and what I would like to see happen with it. 
uh, moving forward. And obviously, I was quite grateful for the uh, for the members of the board uh, for their unanimous support for that for that motion. In addition to the administration, uh, you know, being being uh, amenable to uh, to researching the uh, uh, what 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 could and what might happen. Um, now, obviously, uh, the economic situation uh, that we have now is, is very different than what we saw in December. So the aspirations for which I, what I had back in December, you know, obviously have to be tempered and, and, and be made more realistic. So, so again, you know, with, with the, I guess the, 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 uh, the, the quote 50% that expressed it, um, uh, you know, support for, for what's been proposed here, uh, uh, you know, again, I do share the concerns that, you know, the, the popularity of this program uh, might, might see a significant bump uh, because again, people's economic situations will change, and we don't necessarily want it to uh, uh, go too deeply in terms of what what, what, we're, what we're looking to do um, in terms of overall revenue. Uh, however, uh, you know, when I did see this come back, uh, essentially uh, uh, the same in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 income breakdown and and the rebates you know, becoming you know, more you know, again fully aligned with with the PA. Plan uh, except for the uh, the upper bound on the on the last bracket, uh, I was surprised to see that given how how pointedly um, you know, I expressed my, my reservations for for a couple of the changes that were there. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to just remind everybody that that one of the or at least how I envision what an expansion is is the expansion goes from a baseline and works to a expand the individual benefit to the recipients, and or and also to uh, you know increase eligibility and participation. Uh, I was not um, envisioning an expansion to be a reduction or a step back for anyone that that that's participating in the plan, because um, uh, because again you know I, I did not want this to be a benefit reduction for anybody. I wanted this to move forward. Um, now, as I was opened up with these comments saying that, you know, I'd fully recognize the, uh, the economic realities that we have here. Uh, so, and, and also the uncertainties of where this plan can, can go. I was very much in favor of looking at this as an incremental approach. So, so again, I appreciate, you know, where the steps that were taken uh, by, by, by the administration in terms of where they were looking uh, to, uh, to make changes. Um, and, I, and again, I'm, I am heartened to, 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 to hear that uh, you know, the eventuality of trying to, to fulfill the full $35,000 income range of, of the plan over whatever years it's going to take to do that. Um, you know, I again uh, support the, uh, the elimination of that B1 term, um, but I really strongly feel that we need to keep the original zero to 10,000 range at $650. And then, and then have the ten thousand to fifteen thousand at at, at five hundred. Um, again, if you're thinking of the people who have to use this plan and who are are in that eight to ten thousand dollar bracket, one hundred fifty dollar difference is going to be truly significant. Uh, I I really don't think that that we should we need to require perfect alignment to the PA plan. I don't think that that's necessary. Um, and what I would like to propose for consideration here is if, for instance, if we were to forego the $50 bump in the $15,000 to $18,000 range instead of $300, keep it at the $250 level that the current plan has, um, and then you know, look to expand the income qualification for that bracket up to, let's say, $22,000 again, so then there's a modest, a very modest increase. If we use Mr. Saul's numbers from from his uh, calculations. Uh, the um, if everybody uh, who applied on the PA plan from 2017 uh, were to move forward, and it's about ten thousand eight hundred dollars attributed to that eight to ten thousand dollar group. If we give them the additional one hundred fifty dollars, if we then put the sixty four point four eight percent. Assumption on that, that's going to be just under $7,000 cost in order to, to retain that uh, $650 level. 
Uh, if we forego the $50 range or, or bump in the $15,000 to $18,000 range of incomes, full um, participation with the 2017 numbers would be 6450 and um, um, the 64.48% uh, uh, of that would be 4,159. So we're either gonna look at a, a cost delta to, to finance that of an additional $4,350 or $2,800 if you look at that, that, uh, um, that differential. So, you know, for, you know, again, if we use those assumptions and make that concession that we don't put an increase to fifteen dollars to $18,000, which by the way, could be in a future incremental uh, uh, change, maybe next year, I don't know. It's $2,800 difference using these assumptions. And again, if we, if we have the same participation in 2017, it's, it's, it's $4,350 difference. So again, I, was, I, was, I felt I was quite clear back in December saying that I was not looking for this uh, proposal to uh, create a step back, rather do what, what truly is an expansion uh, to provide some additional benefit to, to capture some additional people in this program, particularly above the $20,000 level. Uh, so, you know, I know I've been, been talking for a while here, but, but I, I truly think that uh, this board uh, needs to consider what it is I said and what we'd like to do and what impact this, this, this plan can and will have on those individuals who truly rely on this program. So thank you for, uh, for giving me the floor and uh, I'll now yield, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Uh, Ms. Bowman? Yes. Um, uh, um, f first, I just want to echo um, everyone's comments about um, our employees who um, willingly embraced a pay freeze. Um, as anyone can see looking at this document, it makes a huge difference and um, helps us um, save what has become known as great programming at East Penn. Um, obviously, um, we're in unprecedented times and there are some cuts that we're making that are definitely not painless to say the least. Um, I did have just some questions to make sure I'm understanding a bunch of things correctly. Um, for the LCTI payment that's in there, is the, it was my understanding that that's sort of like a no interest loan that we have to pay that back in a following year, is that true? Excuse me. I, the way I described it previously was uh, almost like a rebate. So it's a it's a one time rebate. They're uh, taking money from their fund balance, uh, as well as another source. I think it's money they get back in career and technical um, reimbursements. But either way, it's it is considered a one time rebate. I will tell you that subsequently, I had a conversation with the business administrator LCTI, and. I now better understand their process. They have to complete their budget six months prior to ours so that we have their budget. And so uh, they describe that going into next year's budget, they'll certainly be cognizant of the challenges that districts have faced and will likely temper their budget accordingly. So um, I will say that I have less concern now than I did originally, but, but you're, you're correct in re recalling what I uh, uh, had shared that it, it, it is sort of presented as a one-time um, rebate, if you will, or one-time reduction. Um, it, is not, it is not a um, cap on the tuition rate for a year. Uh, but again, I, I have good faith in, in uh, LCTI and the JOC that they will look at their budget uh, very closely going into next year uh, to help the, the districts. Okay, so this isn't something that, I guess I was confused then. I thought we had to pay it back next year or the year after, but we don't. No, we do, we do not. Okay. Essentially, if I can summarize it this way, they have built a fund balance mm -hmm. um, over the years from money that the sending districts have contributed. So in essence, that fund balance is the district's money. And so they're returning a portion of that to help us in these difficult times. Okay, great. Thanks. That clears up uh, that. And then um, 
In terms of consolidating the charter and private school bus routes, which I think is a great idea, I, but I did have a, a question mostly about further doing that in, I think, what becomes phase three. Are there any legalities involved um, in those consolidations? Is there a point where you're not able to do it anymore? In particular, I mean, certainly anything that we would do would be within um, within what is allowable okay. by the law, as, as I, I know you appreciate. I think something that certainly comes into play as we look at continuing to consolidate runs to the greatest extent possible is, for example, way, while we may have students on St. Thomas More and let's say seven generations rostered on the same bus, what we have to be very mindful of is the start and end times of those schools as well, because they're ultimately a driver then of, of those buses and the runs and, and when they begin. And is it feasible to have them have certain groups of students who attend different schools on the same bus and still coordinate with regard to their school drop off and then pick up time. So those are some of the logistics that we continue to look at as well as um, over the summer we receive um, transportation verification forms from each of those private parochial schools as well as the charter school with regard to East Penn residents who attend those schools. So as any changes in student enrollment happens, that's where we'll also continue to carefully monitor those rosters. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I can't figure out what one of my questions is, so I'll skip over that one. Um, I, I did have a, a follow up on the um, property tax rebate program. Um, you know, this is an important program to me, especially this year and next year, um, especially if we are gonna have a tax increase to provide at least some relief for the people who um, can't afford to pay their taxes as, as it is. And I, I think it's a nice counterbalance to um, allowing people who have and can pay more to offset the people who don't have it. Um, I just, I, I think I wanna act, um, echo Dr. Levinson's concerns, but also say that, um, you know, whatever step increase that we do is really okay with me, as long as we plan out to eventually get up to the state level, even if that's um, like 10 years from now, I, I think it'd be nice for us to have that planned in um, long range so that we know what our eventual goal is. Um, but we don't have to put all of the burden on the district now to get there. Um, I just wanted to kind of state my feelings about that since I had talked about that before. Um, and then the, one of the last things I wanted to mention was about clubs. And I, I don't know which clubs are going and maybe um, <laughs> there's a reason um, there, a list isn't provided, but I did want to say that even though um, these after school clubs are not technically part of people's school day. Um, I am, I very much remember our national merit scholars talking about the favorite parts of their school days and almost all of them mentioned clubs. And um, I can speak um, just from my personal experience with as a parent that there were clubs that um, basically kept my kid in school. Um, and uh, allowed him to excel academically in other areas because um, in one case allowed him to eat lunch at a club and not in the cafeteria where he was in a pretty toxic environment. So I would hope that we're very careful there about thinking about clubs as non-academic because I don't think that's the case. Um, and if there's any way we can offset some of these, um, I'm gonna say smaller cuts, I don't mean smaller in terms of ramifications, but smaller in terms of the financial price tag. Um, with fundraising, maybe with the um, Education Foundation, or um, if we can take a little bit more out of the fund balance to save some of these um, programs or that don't cost quite as much money, um, I would be very much for that. Um, and again, it's hard to, for me to uh, <laughs> wage an opinion on that when I don't know what the actual things are that are being cut. But um, I, I just wanted to mention that. 
Um, oh, I, I know what my other question was. Um, usually we have this, and I think because so much has changed, um, I, I sort of missed it, and I think it's in the paperwork somewhere. What is the um, tax increase? What does it come out to in terms of dollars for the average homeowner? So the increase um, at one and a half percent, the additional would be roughly $58 for the average homeowner. Thank you, that's all I had. If, if Ms. Bowman, if I could just um, comment on your reflection with specifically with regard to clubs and activities and, and say that I, I couldn't agree more and I, I hope that you can appreciate certainly administration as we've, as we've continued to present all of the reductions through that are that are in really all phases all three phases um, certainly we presented them in terms of those cuts that potentially have less of an impact on an instructional program or an educational program but I will echo your sentiment that I think in some way shape or form every one of these cuts has a, a level of pain associated with it um, because we certainly have worked very hard in this in this school community to build high quality instructional programs, um, certainly co-curricular, extracurricular athletic activities are a valuable part of our, of our students' school experiences. And so like you, we never want to minimize those. Um, and so I, I do appreciate your reflection on that. Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Winch. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the teachers and administration. You guys are amazing. You are wonderful and thank you so much. You are what makes our district our district. But I also wanted to um, ask some few questions along with my big thank yous. Um, my kids thank you and all the kids thank you too. Um, I, w I just wanted to echo Alyssa, Alisa and um, Ms. Bowman, as well as um, Dr. Levinson about restoring the $650 to the eight or zero, I guess it's the zero to $10,000 range. I would be in favor for restoring that. Um, I also had a question about one of the reductions to staff through attrition. Um, it was Listed, you said it was maintenance, but I was under the impression it was custodial, and I don't know if there was a difference. And so I wanted to know what that responsibility looked like. It is a custodian position. Okay, so my, my fear is, um, I, I'm just thinking about um, that losing a custodial, custodian position when we're in the middle of a pandemic and thinking about all of those new tasks that we're gonna all be tasked with in order to keep mitigating uh, germs, not just to our buildings, but our entire community. And so I just wanted to think about that a little bit on what that might really look like on, does that responsibility now fall on the teachers? And if so, are we paying them to do that? on those green slips I hear, heard about? And what is the cost on that? I'm just thinking about the overall cost of the extra sanitation in the buildings. That would absolutely not be a responsibility that um, would go to teachers at all. Okay. Um, in working with Mr. Anushko, our director of facilities, it is a cut that, again, sort of to my, to my comment that I just shared with Ms. Bowman, certainly there are implications for all of the reductions that, were, um, that we are putting forward. We have a $6 million deficit that we have a responsibility to attempt to minimize or to close that. To I get it. Gap. And so, um, but it is, it is a position, obviously like all positions that we've carefully considered and we believe we would be able to fulfill those responsibilities by shifting around some of the current staff. Okay, I trust you. 
And if you if you believe that, I believe that you will that will happen. So thank you. I needed to hear that as a mom and just thinking about, you know, germs. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just mention, um, even when we go into green, um, as we're looking at reducing clubs and activities, uh, when we go into the green phase of the governor's reopening, we are not going to be allowed to have large gatherings. So are those programs and activities and events um, that usually require large gatherings uh, a part of the reduction in costs? Such as, I, I don't wanna, I'm not naming anything, but like something like homecoming that maybe could be shifted to the end of the year. Or... Well, and I'll share as well, at this point in the reduction process, administration has not identified exactly which okay. after school clubs or activities would be cut. And so that would be something that we would clearly work with our building leaders um, and identify whether it's through those clubs that were most recently formed and or those clubs with the lowest enrollment um, that would potentially not be offered. And so we've not yet identified exactly which clubs would not be offered. We simply put it forward as a reduction strategy. Um, but, and certainly like there are some clubs in which the student membership is much larger than other clubs. And so we would have to look at, um, again, in an ideal world when we are in the green phase, so to speak, and we are here face to face with our students, we would have to look at um, simply restructuring how those clubs meet, potentially meeting in a large group area um, with, 100, with 100 students or 50 students is not feasible, but the club potentially meeting in smaller groups, um, not necessarily all at the same time, may be an option and or meeting virtually. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was more thinking about like the events, um, but yeah, I, I, I can see that. And even I was, my, my thoughts keep going to, you know, the movie theaters and, or not the movie theaters, the, the theater program, which I would hate to, you know, even see that. I and mean, you could do a lot of those things without an audience and it wouldn't matter. Right. Um, but I, I was just thinking about some of those things that we might not be able to do at all because of, um, the governor's order. So thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. And thank you again. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Winch. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. Thank you. Um, I, I too would like to thank our teachers and administration. I, you know, I think um, this is a testament to the quality and character of, of the teachers and, and our administrators. And I have a bit of a bias since I grew up in the school district, but I, you know, this is further evidence of what a great school district, school district we have. And I think it really gives meaning to um, hashtag East Penn proud. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we had to, that, you know, that we've come to this and, and, and really I can't share my appreciation enough. A um, couple of points. I, 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 I support uh, Dr. Levinson. And, 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 you know, his statements regarding the, the property tax rebate program um, and, and, you know, shifting the initial 650 rebate uh, thresholds. I, I would be interested, though, of course, to see what, what kind of cost impact that, that would have if that is, you know, readily or easily available, um, just, just to have a better understanding of, of you know, what that change would, would cost. Um, I also echo Ms. Bowman's um, sentiments. Um, you know, I think clubs are, are a very important aspect of, of education and, and maturity. Um, so when, when, when the decision time does come to make the decision, I'd be interested in understanding, you know, what factors were involved in, in deciding what clubs to, to eliminate. Um, you know, and, and what 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 the, the expected impact is is of that, um, and then finally, I I, I think it's great. I, I absolutely agree with um, if we are able to fill the uh, elementary teacher and specialist teacher positions. I, I mean, I think those are are critical, particularly at the elementary level. Um, that to the extent we can keep the class sizes um, down. Um, you know, I, I can't express enough how, how important I think that is. So, you know, overall, thank you so much um, for, for the efforts. I'm, I mean, this is such, this is an activity no one wants to ever undertake. Um, 
you know, and, you know, I, and, you know, Lord knows coming on board less than a year ago, I never expected that this would be my first <laughs> year uh, dealing with these circumstances, but, you know, working with this administration and, and our teachers and staff, um, you know, it, it just really, I don't want to say it makes it easier, but, but it, you know, it just, it, we're, we're, we're fortunate to, I think here in East Penn to have this group that we have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski, uh, Mr. Bird. Yes, first of all, I want to thank the uh, teachers and administration uh, for taking the approach with this difficult times and, uh, and uh, being uh, on board with the board and the community. I also want to thank the administration for the work they've done on the budget. The budget process is about listening to the voices of the community and all the stakeholders in the district. And I think the, uh, the administration's done a great job in listening to the community and the district and making a balance uh, position, a balance uh, process in maintaining and to also maintain the quality of education in the district. So I really appreciate all the work the administration has done on the last few weeks as we go through this involve this uh, budget process. I have one question uh, about the proposed millage uh, index. I wonder how the Act 1 in the future will affect uh, what we do this year. Uh, is that something we need to be looking at or be concerned about? I know there's been some talk about going to a zero millage, but we have a proposal 1.5%. So can anybody uh, entertain that for me, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to take the first stab at it. Um, Mr. Bird, if one of the things we try to do in the long range uh, fiscal plan is model various scenarios um, and so there's a section labeled as uh, scenario analysis, and that will visually show you, because I added some, some graphs, the impact of, um, of not, uh, for instance, uh, having an increase in the current year. And, and what happens is, you know, each, I hate to say it, you, that you fall behind, but that's the terminology that, that, that's sort of uh, used uh, at times, you, you fall behind year after year um, by not uh, taking advantage of of capturing that increase in in the current year. And in in the years prior to Act One, that that was okay because you could go ten years without a tax increase, for instance, as a school district, and then you could raise their taxes ten percent. Certainly wasn't popular with the uh, with the um, taxpayers, but it was something that a board could do. Today, you can't do that under Act 1 because you're indexed from year to year. So if you, quote, miss an opportunity to raise your taxes, even a small amount, you, you really never get that opportunity back. Um, again, I'm, I'm not, uh, I guess, advocating whether or not 1% uh, is right or wrong for this current year, um, but just there, there certainly is... Um, um, there certainly is some 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 sentiment in, in broadly that when you when you miss a tax increase, you don't have the opportunity to make that up. So you're saying basically you should uh, this 1.5 millage that you propose is probably uh, a positive thing to do for going forward for the future. I would say it's a positive thing for the school district's finances. I'll let it at that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Saul. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Bacher. I too would like to express my gratitude to the teachers and to the uh, administration for their uh, willingness to consider a, a um, wage freeze at this critical time as we try to, to balance all the stakeholders requirements and and it really does i guess go to the character as, as a couple of other people have uh, said of the people that we have working for the district and it and it really makes a difference uh, in my from my perspective that you know they are part of the process and i and i think that is 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 uh, very much uh, an important uh, uh, aspect of why we have such a great relationship with all of the people that uh, work in the district uh, 
I just have a couple of things. Uh, I do appreciate uh, uh, Mrs. Campbell and Mr. Saul's response to some of my question. I would like them to, you know, as we look at uh, how we're going to close the gap and, and make, um, uh, you know, the final uh, determination of what uh, the level of funding we need to make and what level of uh, potential tax uh, impacts we are going to ask the community to bear some of those items, especially those things with respect to field trips and co-curricular activity, transportation, uh, certain equipment like weight room equipment that we may or may not need to purchase uh, in the coming year. Uh, there's things like non-essential supplies for some of the, uh, the activities uh, and, you know, certain scrimmages and other things that, you know, we can maybe do without in this, in this particular year. I mean, those added up to over, you know, over about $35,000, $40,000. So, you know, as you look at, you know, the final uh, kind of tallies of things, uh, please give that some consideration. And I also would like to, you know, uh, think hard about as we look at what the level of tax, uh, you know, increase we might have to ask the citizens uh, here to, to consider, um, you know, that we really do think hard about whether uh, we can reduce the 1.5% that's been proposed uh, at, and still maintain the programs. I know in previous uh, discussions, the board has asked about going to a 0% increase. Uh, I, I understand Mr. Saul's concerns about the financial impact, impact it has on the district, but as we look at the final tally, uh, hopefully we can uh, continue to balance the needs of the district as well as uh, the, the taxpayers at this point in time. Uh, you know, it is a critical time for many people uh, who are making uh, you know, difficult choices on what to be able to afford and not to afford and anything we can do to, to lower that rate, but not, you know, go further than we have to, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Uh, Dr. Munson? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I, I can't be as eloquent as any of my colleagues in, in um, my thanks and appreciation for um, the teachers and other professional staff as well as administrators um, in offering this wage concession. It makes a huge difference to our district um, and particularly to our kids. Uh, so thank you. Um, I, I, I had two, I guess, Three, three kind of comments. I mean, the first was, is respect, with respect to the, the clubs uh, in uh, cut in phase three. Um, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of, of this cut in, in part because of the reasons that my colleagues have given about the kind of importance that they have. But I understand we are, we're cutting important things now at this point to, to, to balance the budget. Um, so my, my, my skepticism comes more from um, the kind of bang for your buck nature of this kind of cut. Um, these clubs are, are very inexpensive um, and they provide a lot of benefit for the money that is spent on them. And at the same time, cutting them um, is, is one of the smallest sort of itemized cuts that we've seen um, on the list. Um, so I don't want to minimize what $15,000 um, means, but um, in, in terms of the kinds of discussions that we've been having over the last several sessions talking about the budget, um, $15,000 does not substantially move the needle um, on um, on some of these things, um, so you know, I so I'm I'm both skeptical that that is the place to cut. I'm also skeptical that uh, when when we need it, that that will be a place that we can come up with the cuts that are necessary in order to balance the budget. Um, my second comment um, actually speaks to uh, what Mr. Champagne just um, mentioned. I am also. Um, I am also mindful of the point that uh, Mr. Saul made um, about the very real limitations on local control that Act One um, imposes on us um, and uh, the concern for the future if we do not have a, a tax increase. Um, that said, I mean, I would refer to the comments of Mr. Saul and, and, and others uh, in this meeting and previous, in that, uh, previous meetings and that we are really in unprecedented times. And these unprecedented times are not just for the school district, they're for the community. Um, and so while I would normally 
really um, be uh, persuaded by this argument. Um, I think in, in this year, in this time, I, I still remain uh, concerned about this balance and the need to recognize uh, that we are moving towards 20% unemployment, um, that people are having um, lots of, of problems that, um, that are exacerbated by a tax increase uh, by the school district. And so, um, you know, I hope that we can con still continue to look um, at figuring out a way to have a 0% tax increase. Um, I'm not saying that, that I, necessarily sort of come down on 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 that you know i want to see the options um that leads to a, a sort of side point which is i continue to be concerned about the timeline uh, for this budget uh, you know we we now are i i believe scheduled to have an up or down vote on the final budget uh with no other discussion um to sort of hammer these these things out um i guess the final uh Point I wanted to make is about the property tax rebate program and I just wanted to share a, a slightly different perspective than has been shared so far. Um, I, am, I am very supportive of this program, um, very appreciative uh, of Dr. Levinson um, bringing this up and being such a strong advocate for it. Um, and I also share his and other uh, people's um, priority for expanding uh, this program. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm actually supportive of the administration's proposal uh, to align the uh, income categories with the state income categories. And for me, it, it is not a matter of what the cost to the district is. I think it's pretty clear from the documents that, um, that Mr. Saul has put together and that Dr. Levinson has, um, has reviewed uh, for us that the, the revenue ch difference for the, the district is, is relatively minor. But there's a bigger issue at stake, uh, right, which is that, you know, part of the problem with many of these programs is that they're underutilized because of government bureaucracy. Um, and the district continuing um, to add layers of bureaucracy to this program by running its own income categories that are different than the state categories is a non-trivial issue uh, when it comes uh, to the um, community's use of this program. One of the things that's in those original documents um, in, the, in the estimates of what it's going to cost is a um, is an, 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 an estimate that by simplifying the system, the rebate program, particularly the paperwork involved, we are actually gonna have greater participation of those are, that are eligible. So what that means to me is that by realigning the income ranges, we are not reducing the program, we're actually expanding it. We're putting more tax dollars back into the hands of more people in our community who are most at need. Uh, most in need, and so um, for that reason, uh, you know, I, I we can we can talk about whether or not the maximum household income should increase to 22 or 23, or how big the steps should be over the year, uh, you know, over the different years. But I, I feel pretty strongly that we need to align the system with the other systems that are already in place in government, because um, that will increase participation. It will reduce the burden. Um, on people who want to uh, take advantage uh, of this program. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Munson. Munson. Uh, I guess I'll have a, a couple of quick comments. Uh, I would also uh, like to extend my appreciation to the teachers and administrators for taking a pay freeze uh, in the upcoming budget year. Uh, uh, the, the numbers speak for themselves on how much this helps us uh, with our budget issues this year. So uh, I just want to add my name to the list of people thanking, thanking these groups. Uh, it really helps out and makes things um, uh, certainly better, significantly better. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the administration, uh, Mrs. Campbell's teams and, and Mrs. Campbell's team and Mr. Saul specifically for uh, their work on the budget, uh, particularly in so-called spreading the pain. Um, uh, uh, one of the problems with that is if everyone feels pain, nobody's happy with the budget. Um, but I do appreciate um, not only coming up with ideas, but when uh, situations change, taking the changes into your consideration and revisiting um, decisions in light of the new situation. Like, uh, you know, this was a good cut when we were trying to close a huge deficit, but now that 
you know, we're here, is that cut still the cut we would make? So I just wanted to uh, put out, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I guess I would, uh, um, uh, would always want to have um, the lowest tax increase we can achieve. Um, but I am comfortable with the path we're following now to see where that goes. Uh, and coming out with something that, yes, it's, it's a burden on some payers, but there's also burdens uh, for others and for the future if we, uh, if we don't, depending on where we end up. So I, I wanted to make that in mind. Um, and then finally, on the uh, rebate expansion program, um, uh, I'm uh, somewhat torn. <laughs> um, I was persuaded by uh, Dr. Levinson's argument um, that an expansion shouldn't be a cutback to um, uh, any anyone who's currently receiving the the benefit, um, and I appreciate his offer of a way to sort of uh, restructure the proposal to um, perhaps make it um, uh, more similar in revenue. Um, I don't know. I'm also persuaded by Dr. Munson's argument. I don't know how much the um, different income levels is driving the non-participation versus the, uh, the additional um, question uh, that, that weeds out a small percentage of people that eliminating that might um, uh, expand the, the usage. So I could probably go either way. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm perhaps a, limited, a, a little leaning in this year of tough times uh, towards the proposal to not uh, restrict the uh, income, uh, the, the amount of the rebate to people that are already getting it. And maybe even, um, I don't know how fine grain you, you get in income levels, but maybe even reduce the expansion of the top level in order to achieve that and get the expansion through the simplification of the form uh, and the added marketing. So just my two cents. Um, uh, I don't feel as strongly as, as Dr. Munson or Dr. Levinson, I think, but um, uh, those are my leanings on this. And with that, I'll see if anyone else has comments. I see uh, Mr. Jankowski has your hand up, but I don't know if that's still up from before or not. No, that's up from before. I'll, I'll put it down. Uh, Ms. Bowman has another comment. Um, I just wanted to follow up um, because Dr. Munson was very persuasive. And, and so I, I think I just want to go on the record to say that it's more important for me personally that we expand this program in some way with the goal of eventually getting up to a true income bracket that, bracket that makes sense for people. Um, I, I believe, I'm going from memory now, I think the states is 30 or 35,000 and we're, very, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we're very far away from that from right now. So um, it's more important to me that we would eventually over a period of years, try to reach that level in some way. And then in terms of the bottom bracket, um, how we solve that problem, I'm very open to whether it's grandfathering in the people who are currently getting that so that they're not paying more or some other solution. Um, my, I think as long as we can solve the problem of people not being able to pay their tax bill, like that's the main thing that we're all trying to do and how we actually get there. Um, I'm not so particular about. Um, and then I, I, this all did kind of bring up another question in my mind. Um, because this is going to be a year where a lot of people can't pay their property tax bills. And I'm wondering if that's something we as a board should talk about um, providing some sort of one-time relief um, and not following the protocol that we usually follow, um, given that we would hope that within a year or two, um, they would be in a more secure job situation. If I could just jump in, um, I'm I'm not sure what you mean in terms of follow the usual protocol. I don't um, know what it is. I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'll draw some conclusions, and I likely to give him a heads up. I'm gonna call on uh, Mr. Fisher just to affirm what I'm saying. Looks like he's getting ready anyway. Um, but the but the real estate the the local 
uh, local local tax enabling act i think i have that correct um is very specific about the levying collection and uh, delinquency of taxes is very prescriptive and i'm not sure that we have the the um leniency to perhaps do what you've suggested so I, i'll introduce it that way and i'll let mr fisher pick up where i have messed up well, Mr. Saul, you don't mess up. Uh, you're correct. All the, it, it, we can all follow to see if there's actually any legislation comes because what I can tell you is that municipalities such as townships were, uh, I believe it was Act 13 or 15, I'm so confused on all the Act numbers this year, all, all the re legislation. They were allowed or given a choice to adopt a resolution to extend the time period for the uh, the discount payment uh, and uh, and or extend the time for uh, declaring a delinquency until the end of the year. They have that option by legislation. Right now, there is no such option available to a school district. So for the moment, well, I, I agree with Mr. Saul's analysis at this point. We'll wait and see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Do you have another comment or question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, well, first I'd like to thank everybody uh, who, who, who did take the opportunity to talk about the, the property tax rebate program and their thoughts. Uh, I, I appreciate the level of thought and consideration that you've all given this. Um, so I'd like to agree with, with, with Dr. Munson's, Dr. Munson's assertion that simplification will help with participation. Um, but I want to say that uh, I think that the changes that, that were proposed to the form, primarily eliminating that percent factor and that B1 uh, calculation. I remember when I first looked at the form, I was uh, you know, kind of like, you know, you know, what the heck is this? And it was, it was kind of confusing to do. So the information that's, that's required in order to apply for the district's PTR versus that of the uh, Pennsylvania program is now essentially identical and now you only have to look at the brackets and it'd be very easy to determine the you know what it is that you qualify for um, so I think that uh, you know in, in that regard those aspects of what's been proposed did greatly sim simplify the form so I think that we can achieve much of what Dr. Munson uh, is looking for in terms of making it easier on people to uh, to apply uh, for it, um, but again, I, I you know I, I do think, you know, particularly in light of these current economic times, preserving that benefit for those lower income brackets, I do think is quite important. Um, and you know, over time, uh, you know, aligning things to get more closely to to the PA plan, particularly you know going from that twenty two thousand or that what's been proposed to going from twenty to twenty two thousand, making its way on up to to thirty five. Is certainly a, a very good uh, uh, aspiration. So, so again, you know, I do think that uh, what's been proposed does simplify the form, uh, and, and and you know, and, and considering uh, what I had proposed, I think is still going to uh, you know make it worthwhile for the community to participate in. So, again, thank you for all your your comments and and and, uh, and thoughts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levinson. Is there anyone else wishing to comment or have questions? Dr. Bucker, if I can just follow up to Dr. Levinson's comment, um, just for clarification before we uh, come back, uh, perhaps at the next meeting with a final uh, something ready for boards of, the board's approval. Um, it seems like tonight there was, was clearly a, a majority um, leaning in the direction uh, that, that, that of Dr. Levinson's suggestion. Um, clearly based on our recommendation, um, administration was a little bit more like-minded with Dr. Munson's um, description of, of the changes. Uh, what I would propose to bring back is um, maybe not uh, making the adjustments to the higher income brackets, but simply making the first bracket the zero to 10,000 so that that would capture those 8,000 to 10,000. And then we would just, the rest of the brackets would be, you know, 10,000 to 15, and we would let the bottom of the, of the chart remain as it is. So again, I'm, I'm trying to get 
uh, as much consistency uh, with the state as possible. So does that make sense, Mr. Uh, Dr. Levinson? Uh, actually, I'm a little confused about what, what you proposed. So you're saying keep the zero to 10 at 650? Correct. And then the 10 to 15 at? 500. At 500, and then use 15 to 18 at 300? Yep. And then use, uh, and then, and then. 18 the, to 22 at the 250. 18 to 22 at 250. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that would certainly align, align with the, uh, you know, the PA plan a, a bit better. Um, obviously it does cost a little bit more to, 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 to what we we're talking about. But, but again, I, I, I do find that to be uh, appealing and what's being proposed. So thank you for that. Uh, um, that offer. And I don't see any more uh, hands up. So uh, moving on to announcements. Uh, we had executive sessions on May 14th and May 20th, uh, where we discussed negotiations. Our next uh, regularly scheduled board meeting will be Monday, June 8th at 7.30. And I'll now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And second. Could you say your names for the record? Jeff Jankowski moved. Paul Josh Champagne, Hull. second. Thank you. Mrs. Allen, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Bird. Yes. Mr. Champagne. Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Dr. Munson? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Winch? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Bacher? Aye. Nine ayes. All accounted for. Thank you, everyone. Meeting is now adjourned.